Let's bow our heads. Thank you for your word, O Lord. Pray, O Lord, that you bless us as we hear the preaching of your word and let us be edified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, to take it from the top, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 1, Acts chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Over to Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, verse 11. Now, we know Cornelius very well. Uh, his, why I say that? Because I preached recently about uh, the topic uh, about Cornelius uh, his this man was not saved and this is how the Bible describes him and it's not somebody talking here this is the Holy Spirit talking so this man feared God he's a devout man and he feared God with all his house that means he even commanded his household after him just like Abraham which gave much alms to the people that means he did good deeds he didn't let let his right hand know what his left hand was doing and he prayed to God always in fact more information about that Cornelius tells us that he was fasting at that time he was fasting for, for, for about four days and he was praying and the angel of God appeared to him so this man was not saved imagine going to Cornelius' door right at, at that point and knocking on his door and asking him are you 100% sure you're going to heaven you know what he's going to say right of course I mean, I'm doing good. I'm, I, in fact, I was praying <laughs> when you knocked on the door. And guess what? An angel just appeared to me. See, God speaks to me. He, like, <laughs> he's going to tell you of, for sure. I'm saved. All the good things I've been doing, I, I read the word, I, I fear God. I mean, look at my household. We do everything right. I've had people tell me, look at the children I've raised. I've raised good children. That's why I know I'm going to heaven. Cornelius can say the same, but it's not of works. And um, no need to be the dead horse, but let's go forward. In Romans chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. In parenthesis, additional information, the Bible goes on to say, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So what does it mean by the doers? You know, by the law, no man can be justified because nobody can do the law completely. Once you break one, you've broken all, right? And uh, and you can say, oh, I broke it. I broke some laws, but God has forgiven me. How, how did he forgive you? It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that there is remission of sins. See what I mean? So you can say, oh, I've stopped sinning. <laughs> That's impossible. Once you've break, broken it once, you've broken it all. Uh, so, but if you can keep all the laws, but the doers of the law shall be justified. If you keep all the laws, then you'll be justified. That's why Jesus answered the rich man, or yeah, the young rich ruler, and you know, uh, and told him, hey, do all the laws and you'll be fine. So Jesus was right. He wasn't lying. But it's impossible. The young rich ruler thought that he, he kept all the laws, or maybe he lied. I don't know. Verse 14, for when the Gentiles, this is the point I'm trying to get to, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So the Gentiles can do the law also. Yes, they did not receive the law, the oracles, but it doesn't mean they cannot do the laws. They cannot keep God's word. Hey, God is Lord of all, which what Peter was saying. Jesus is Lord of all, and his, his laws are written in our hearts. Verse 15, it says, which should the law the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another so they know what is right and wrong <laughs> right they know when they're doing something right they know when they're doing something wrong and that's why they fall into sin it's not just oh the jews that sin because sin is a transgression of the law of god so other people can't sin because the law wasn't given to them you know then from that doctrine you jump into uh oh jesus wasn't sent to us he was sent just to the jews just he's the messiah of just the jews and some people are even crazy to say oh jesus never said he was the messiah of the jews i mean <laughs> so the law uh they know what is right and wrong and that is the law written in their hearts their conscience bearing them witness so after the parenthesis it goes on in the day when god shall judge the secrets of men by jesus christ according to my gospel not just judge the say uh, the uh, the jews but the secrets of men so if you skip that parenthesis this is how it reads from verse 12 to 16 
says, for as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. Right? So, talking about the Gentiles. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Right? So, talking about the Jews. I mean, the, the ones that received the law. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to all my gospel. So, there's no uh, respect of persons. So, I'm going to judge the Jews separately. I'm going to judge Gentiles separately. No. <laughs> God is just going to judge everyone. Verse 3. Let's move on. Back to Acts chapter 10. Back to the story. So this Cornelius guide, Bible says in verse 3, he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour, that is about 3 p.m. in the day, ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. Open to John chapter 11. John chapter 11 verse 47. Now, God speaking to a person does not mean the person is saved. Right? God spoke or God speaks to Satan. Obviously, Satan is doomed. Uh, God spoke to Balaam. Okay, some can argue Balaam is saved. Um, of the group that say he's not saved, he's a false prophet. But God spoke to Balaam. He spoke to him. Uh, you say, okay, but show me another example. Okay, how about the high priest, right? Uh, Caiaphas, I think. We're going to read that. John chapter 11, verse 47. God spoke through the high priest, and that guy's reprobate. He, he was gone. I mean, he's the one that rents his clothes, whether it's part of Jesus. I mean, that guy... <laughs> I don't believe he was saved. Uh, in fact, I even believe he's a reprobate. But the Bible says in verse, 11, uh, verse 47, John 11, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees, then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both their place and nation. What is in their heart is revealed. So what are they trying to keep? Our land. Who owns the land? Jesus. What are they trying to keep? Their ways. Because they are now teaching the doctrines of men. But I digress. Let's focus. Verse 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being a high priest the same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Now consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation shall perish. Uh, uh, whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather to get together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. So he... The Holy Spirit, he spoke by the Spirit of God. So he said, but that means he's saved. doesn't mean he's saved. <laughs> right? He didn't speak it of himself. Obviously, it wasn't of the devil. It was by the Spirit of God. He was prophesying. That means explaining the Word of God. He was teaching the doctrine in the Bible. But that was not of himself. So God speaks to the world also. And he's speaking through his Word. Sending servants. Sending us, prophets, to go and explain it. Clarify it. Speaking his Word to, uh, to the world. And through his creation, God is talking to us, talking to the whole world. He's speaking to the world by the, the, the visible, invisible things that he created. That they, they, they can see just by creation. And including their conscience. So God is speaking to us and he's speaking to everyone. Because God is speaking to somebody, it doesn't mean the person is saved. Amen. So Cornelius was doing good. He was doing good, um, uh, giving alms, helping people, praying. That's all good to do. And if you do good, if you, if I believe in an unsaved person, like Cornelius helps a saved person, helps a prophet, he will receive his reward. I'll be here, here on earth. He's not going to receive eternal life as a reward. But if you're saved, you receive eternal life as a reward, as Jesus said. Plus hundredfold here on earth, hundredfold mothers and sisters and all of that. So, but he will receive his reward. And he was doing good, and it came up as a memorial before God, and God, you know, used his attempt to get him saved. So, do good to all men. That's what the Bible says. Do good to all men. And if a Gentile is obeying this law, he'll receive his reward. Verse 5. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose son name is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So, obviously, Cornelius was not doing enough. With all the things he was doing, you say, so what is missing? Uh, oh, oh. 
He's going to tell him to start coming to church. I mean, the guy was fasting, the guy was praying. What else is missing? So there's something clearly that was missing. And fortunately for Cornelius, he obeyed. But Bible says in verse 7, And when the angel which spake to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. So Cornelius took this seriously. It reminds me of Abraham. When God tells Abraham to do something, Abraham does it diligently. He takes it seriously. He does it immediately. So who did he send? Send He sent his personal secret service, right? I mean, he's a centurion, so probably uh, high in the list of assassination. If the rebels want to rebel in that place, they'll want to get him. Because if they get the head, then, you know, they can scatter the, his troops. Anyway, so he had secret service. He had uh, guards. So this guard is one of the, his loyal, trustworthy servants that was staying next to him. And two of his household servants. So he sent him, the guard, and those two servants to show how serious he was. Sending your personal service. So, how seriously do you take God's word? This is a guy that is unsaved. Right? He hears the word of God from an angel. How seriously do you take God's word? When you see it, when you read the Bible, when the preacher explains the word of God to you, you say, oh, but you're a child of God. God requires much from you. So, um, you say, oh, but I don't hear angels talking to me. If an angel is speaking to me, then I'll take it seriously. I'm an angel talking to you. Who do you think that God wrote the letters to in um, Revelation? To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, to the angel... Who else? You see, we're angels. Angel just means a messenger. Someone's carrying the message of God. So it's not just me. It can be when you're talking with yourselves. So if the person is telling you God's word, hey, that is God giving you a message. The word of God. Whether it's someone older than you or younger than you or your, or your colleague. So, or when you're reading your Bible, that is God speaking to you also. You have the Holy Spirit in you. So you don't have to wait until an angel of God appears. And you say, oh yeah, now I'll obey God. All right, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went on, uh, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So this is the next day. It was about noon. Sixth hour is the middle of the day, noon. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheet to meet at the four corners and led down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. So Peter appears to have prayer times, right? So it was middle of the day, he went to pray, took some time out. See, men of the Bible have shown exam uh, this example of prayer times, just going to pray. Jesus had his own prayer time and his disciples knew, okay, I'm going to the mountain to pray. Early in the morning he goes to pray, at night he goes to pray. Daniel too had prayer times and they're like, you know, we're going to trap Daniel and they knew about his prayer times. I mean, they actually targeted Daniel because of that, to throw him in the lion's den. David too had prayer times. David in the, in the night times and the night seasons he's praying he's praying so these guys have prayer times and peter too is showing that example okay i'm going to pray at this time and why do i prepare the food so always pray always continue to ask god god jesus even gave the uh, the, uh, the the story the parable of the of the wicked judge with the widow asking him asking him asking him and even a wicked judge will listen to somebody just somebody that has no power over him she's a widow she has all she can do is just beg <laughs> right it's not going to make him lose his job. But as wicked as he was, he still listened to that widow. How much more your father in heaven? God is not saying I'm a wicked judge. God is saying if that guy could do it, could listen. Say, because you're, we are wearing me. <laughs> How much more your father in heaven that wants to hear from you, that wants to talk with you. So set times and just pray and pray and pray. You say, yeah, Peter, what do you need to pray for? <laughs> um, if Peter can be praying, how much more us? <laughs> right? Because we're not apostles, by the way. In case you thought I was an apostle. Um, God made the test quite easy for him also. So, what was, you know the test, he brought down the sheet. And this is why it's not good to make Bible movies. Although I would like to watch them if it's very real. I, you know, I've not seen anyone that has been perfect. Like, doesn't add anything. It's because it's almost impossible. How will you make the movie of the sheet? Because I have this picture of you know, a sheet coming down. But I'm, I can bet everybody's picture of the sheet coming down is a white sheet, right? Did he say white? Oh, it's not everyone? Oh, wow. In my head, it's like a white sheet coming down. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Neat at the four corners and all these animals on the sheet. 
So, uh, it, and how large is it? How big is it? Is it tight? Like the animals are dipping it down because they are live animals, right? Because it's like kill and eat. So, what's my point here? Oh yeah, so he was hungry and God brings down this sheet and God has an interesting sense of humor. He's trying to tell him, kill and eat. He's an unclean animal and he's hungry. So he's like, oh, you know, I'm hungry. So God understands. So I'm going to kill and eat. <laughs> so it may be easy for him to want to kill and eat. But Peter held himself. He was probably thinking, is a test of the other way around. The test is, you're hungry. Are you going to eat an unclean animal? Doesn't matter how hungry you are. I don't eat this unclean animal. But no, that was not a test. So it's very simple. God, God makes it easy for us. He was hungry and he told him, kill and eat. <laughs> He didn't wait, make, um, make it hard. See, God does not give us things that we cannot overcome, right? He does not uh, give us tests and temptations that we cannot overcome. He'll make a way of escape where, whereby we can bear it. Anyway, that's just what I wanted, I wanted to point out there. But according to the laws, the Old Testament laws, Peter was right. He was not supposed to kill and eat unclean animals, right? Uh, God was teaching Peter that Jesus has fulfilled the law. It is not a sin to kill and eat unclean animals. Everything can be received with thanksgiving that God has created. Don't call what God has uh, cleansed unclean. What God calls clean, don't call it unclean. That's what Jesus was trying to teach him. So, and this is why we follow the traditions. This is why we're built upon the foundations of the apostles. The traditions of the apostles. If not, how else would we know? Right now, we'll still be um, no unclean animals because we're just following the laws. If Jesus just came and died for our sins and just left, right? Without training the apostles, without teaching them. Or he didn't send them and empower them and have apostles for the acts of the apostles after he, he died. We wouldn't know these things, right? If not, he'll still be writing the Bible, maybe. But we wouldn't know these things because it's not a sin to do without eating unclean animals. It's not like, oh, you committed a sin. You haven't eaten your share of unclean animals today. That means you're sinning. No, it's not a sin, but we wouldn't know our liberties that we have in him. Whom the son sets free is free indeed, right? That's sin. Yeah. But we have other liberties because Jesus has fulfilled feel the law. You know, the law was a, a schoolmaster. So in school, you, you must do this, do this, particular time, particular time. But now that you're adult, it's up to you. You have the liberty to choose when you wake up in the morning, to choose when you brush your teeth, you know, and things like that. So we will know those liberties that we have. All right, verse 13. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice speak unto him again the second time. What God had cleansed, call not thou common. Common there means, it's not just common, as we understand. Common means like uh, uh, inferior. Uh, this is of less state. This is common. It's a, it's, a, it's a lower state. So it means inferior. That's the meaning of that word there. Verse 16. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. So three times, talking, trying to emphasize a point. God was emphasizing a point to Peter. Kill and eat, kill and eat, kill and eat. I mean, you should know that God will not tempt you with something evil, right? We tempt you with sin. And obviously the apostles let us know that. But going through the Bible, you will see that, oh, God will not tempt you, will tempt you with something evil, tell you to commit a sin. No matter what he tells you to do, he's not going to commit a sin. So Peter should have known. So as for this trans, Peter was wrong, right? He disobeyed God because he knew it was the voice of God. Even after God explains it to him, what I have cleansed, call not thou common. You know, what I've cleansed, it is clean. You receive it with thanksgiving because it's God giving it to you. So compare that with Ananias. When Jesus told Ananias, go and help this guy, Paul. So, said, but this is Paul that has been terrorizing us. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. And Jesus says, I've chosen him. I've appointed him. He's going to suffer for my name. And Ananias says, okay, I'm going. I'm going to do it. So Peter should have obeyed. Obviously, God knows Peter. You know, Peter is a stubborn guy. <laughs> yes, he's saved. Yes, the Holy Spirit is in him. But the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Doesn't mean that, oh, he's just controlled by the Holy Spirit and he just does everything. He's still Peter. And God likes the fact that he's Peter. That's why he chose him and he used him as Peter. So, but to, um, each vessel has its own appointments. Like, Paul has his own appointment. Peter has his own appointment. So, you can see Peter's, the hardness of, of changing Peter. You know, what I'll call the wilderness, removing the wilderness from, from them, the slavery. Anyway, uh, so where was I here? So if the Bible commands, we do. 
right? It was a teaching moment for Peter. Yes, I know he disobeyed, but it, it wasn't that big of a deal because Jesus was teaching Peter. You might fail the first test, but don't just look down on yourself. Hey, get ready for the second one because th that was a stepping stone for the, s the real test. And this was a trance too. It wasn't like a real life. So it was, since it was a trance, Peter knew that this is a test. God is trying to tell me something. So what is God trying to tell me? So, but the teaching here is if the Bible tells us to do something, we do it. Yes, you can have your questions. And if you have your questions, that's why God gave you pastors. He gave some evangelists, teachers, prophets, Prophets, right to help you to edify you you know you have your brethren that's why you have church it's not only you at home just reading your Bible and you're like I don't understand this what am I gonna do then you're lost you just keep thinking hey come share the Word of God tell people I, I, I don't I don't understand this right talk about the Word of God so uh, you help you but once you understand it then you do it even if it goes against your beliefs and your upbringing like Peter it's not just his beliefs and his upbringing it goes against the Bible <laughs> I mean it's literally going against scripture he's not used to kill, eating any unclean thing it's just like if you hear a voice from God right the Bible tells you you know maybe this is directed to my wife but the Bible tells you kill a snake and eat it you're like whoa or kill a dog <laughs> Somebody knows who I'm talking to. Yeah, kill a dog and eat it. You're like, whoa, 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 slow down. You know, dog is man's best friend. I mean, he's even more than man's best friend. Anyway, I'm digressing because of time. Let me move on. So we should obey the commandments of God as long as it is the voice of God. And the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. Abraham knew it was God's voice when he said, kill the son whom you love. Right? Abraham knew it was God's voice. Hence, you say, how would I know? What is God telling me? Read your Bible. Bible. Read your Bible. And don't be offended when you hear preaching that is the Word of God. Because you don't know the Word of God. Because if Peter was listening to a preaching and the pre preacher is saying, hey, kill this unclean animal and eat it, you'll be like, whoa, 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 something's wrong with that preacher. Something, this, is, this is wrong. I'm offended. You should not be doing this. It's because you don't know the Bible. You don't know the Word of God. Do you see that? And your, your beliefs and your upbringing is distracting or not making you see clearly that this is the word of God. So, again, and let me use this, you know, chance for an announcement. See, if you're offended by something I'm preaching, maybe it's not me, maybe it's you. How about you reach out to me? You know me. I hope you know me, right? <laughs> you guys know me. I'm not trying to hurt somebody. I'm not trying to pull anybody down or make somebody feel bad or anything. You know, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. You know, how Paul said it. Anyway, but you know me. I'll explain further. Maybe I thought you knew it. I might be giving you something that you're not ready for. Now, Paul was conscious of that. Paul said, you're carnal, so I cannot give you spiritual things because you're carnal. And Paul knew because he could see, I might not know, right? I'm not an apostle. I don't have, maybe I'm not well versed, but I might not know. But sincerely, I plan my messages and I'm like, okay, the church is ready for this, church is ready for this. But I might go ahead of myself. Many, a few times, you know, I'm preaching and a new, somebody that just came in for the first time walks out. Because I said something <laughs> that I didn't even think was a big deal. But it was offending to that person. Now if the person had just stayed and said, you know, Pastor, what do you mean by this? You know, oh, so you know, okay, let me show you how everything is in the Bible. So don't get offended easily by preaching. Be ready to receive it, then go home and check whether those things are so. That is how to be a noble believer, like the Bereans. That's an act, right? Oh yeah, I'm gonna get there. Um, where was I? Okay, so what happens when you're offended by preaching or because talk about carnality here don't idolize men because you idolize men you idolize a preacher you had you know i'm for paul i'm for uh, apollos that is being carnal and that's what paul saw and so when you hear preaching from one person oh this preaching is against this guy's preaching and this one is against that preaching are you sure you know the word of god because if your preaching is against this one or this guy's preaching against this one's preaching and oh you're now comparing preachings how about the word of god what does the Bible say? You're not getting offended by somebody else's preaching. Figure out what the Bible says. If not, you idolize men and you are carnal. So be careful about that. Instead of being for a, a, a person, a particular man, no matter who the man is. Oh, there is an apostle. We are built upon the foundation of, of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. So we are for this apostle. No, we are not for Apollos. The Paul say, hey, that is Apollos. This is me. You should be for me, not for Apollos. No, that's not what Paul said. Paul doesn't say, don't be for me, don't be for Apollos, be for God. 
You see that? So it's, even an apostle, you're not supposed to be for an apostle. Oh, I'm for Paul. I'm for Apollos. Wrong. Right? Not to talk of regular men. All right, verse 17. Let's move on. Now, while Peter doubted in himself, that means he was thinking, I don't know what this means. You know, he's trying to wonder, what is God trying to talk, talk to me about? Well, tell me. While Peter doubted himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was son named Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said also, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So, God, you might be asking God for something. Give me a revelation about this. Help me out with any kind of problem. Whether it's the word of God. See, God can answer your question by in a different way or a different method. You just have to keep doing what you know is right. So, what does it... Understand that the Bible is still being written at this point. So, the Holy Spirit is talking to him, literally. Go and do this. Go and do that. This is for writing the Bible, for us to learn from. But what do you know is right? Going to church, you know that is right. The Holy Spirit says you should do that. Reading your Bible, you know that is right. Praying, taking care of your family. You know, all those things, you know that is right. Just continue doing what you know is right. What God has commanded you to do. God will answer your questions questions you see what i mean so you have a problem just continue doing what the holy spirit commands you uh the response it, it might look like so high how is god going to respond to his question just obey he was thinking what does this mean and this is peter that can you know pray to god peter healed somebody from rose somebody from the dead i mean why can't god just explain to him what this means but god is answering him in a different way follow this man it's like <laughs> Okay, how does that answer my question? I'm thinking about what this means. So, Peter knew something was up, but the vision was to prepare him for this mission. And that is why the mission followed after. So, he found his answers in obedience. You see that? You don't find your answers your own way. Find your answers in obedience to God, still obeying his word, his every word. Verse 21. Then Peter went down to the down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? Again, why didn't Jesus just tell Peter the whole story? Hey, I'm I talk um I sent my angel to Cornelius, he's a Gentile, he's going to send some men to you, and I need you to preach him the gospel. Why didn't he say that? <laughs> Alright? But God is trying to teach him something, right? Uh, just like um, uh, what he did with Ananias. When he called Ananias, I told Ananias the whole story. Oh, this is what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. But that was different, because that is Paul. Now, with the Gentiles, how did God do it with Philip also? He just told Philip, go to the desert. Like, he just took him to a, a particular place. Join yourself with this chariot. He wanted Philip to go through the whole experience. That's with Gentiles, right? People that are not Jews, because he's trying to teach them something. Because if he probably tells them, oh, go talk to you, oh, they'll start coming up with questions and questions. So, God knows who he's dealing with. And, and sometimes he might deal with you that way. He might not show you everything because you will fight back. You will have gain time. You will oppose, right? Uh, verse 22. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feared God, and of good report among all the nations of the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. You know what jumps out so much on that verse? A just man. Right? Who got that? So you're like, oh, but the Bible says Cornelius is a just man. Uh, yeah, the Bible says that. What does the Bible say? And they said, they, who are the they? The men that were sent. See, if you were to talk about Cornelius, you'd probably say he was a saved man too. <laughs> I mean, he's worshiping God. He's praying. The guy is fasting every time. I mean, he's giving arms, all of that. You say, of course he's a Christian. So I don't blame them for saying he's a just man. That's what they said. What did the Holy Spirit say? A devout man. <laughs> That's what the Holy Spirit said. You can be devout to anything. Some people are devout to their to their cats, right? So you can be devout to anything. So it was a devout man. Who was he devout to? He was devout to God. He was God fearing all of that. But he wasn't just. He wasn't saved. Because just is a terminology in the Bible for saved. That means he's justified. So this is what the men thought of Cornelius, and I would have thought so too, because you can see somebody if somebody is saved, is by their works that you see their faith, right? And it's, it appeared that he had good works, but it wasn't good works, it was dead works because 
Oh, uh, he wasn't saved. Verse 23. Then uh, called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them. And certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So this will save Peter in the long run. It will save him from the, their inquisition or their scrutiny. Let's put it that way. So he took some brethren with him from Joppa. That means saved brethren, most likely Jews. Verse 24, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, sorry, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and he had called together his kinsmen and near friends. That is the kind of man Cornelius was. So first, Peter went as soon as possible, you see, but that's not as soon as possible, he went the next day. You know, let's not take for granted the technological uh, advancements that affords us all these liberties that we have, where you can just drive somewhere and drive back, a far place and come back. They had to walk there or, or ride a donkey or ass all the way over there. It's, people didn't just have horses anyhow, like that. So, and even if it's on a horse, the horse has to rest. You don't just gas it up, oh, just put gas in it, let's keep going. <laughs> The horse will just die on the road. <laughs> there are people that, okay, maybe just from movies. But they take two horses, right? They, they gallop one, one, one. After that horse dies, they literally leave that horse there and take the next horse and keep going. Because it's something that, because of an emergency. Anyway, the horse will just faint and die. So you can't just travel back and forth. This was as fast as he could. <laughs> this was him taking it seriously the next day. So... Um, let's not uh, uh, look, play, uh, look down on that. So Cornelius too, he was a man that was ready to share this with his family and his relatives and his friends. Everybody. He said, this is serious. Everybody come to my house. Wow. I mean, that's the kind of man who was ready to share with his family, share the gospel or share the word of God because he knew that this was something precious from, from, the, from God. God is going to tell him something very important. And he didn't just keep it to himself. So, not talk of we that are saved, that we know what we have, and that is free for all. And God wants us to share it to all. This man, he invited these people without even God. I don't, it doesn't record in the Bible that God told him to invite everybody. Just say what I, something to tell you. Peter is going to tell you. So, um, and this shows us that the blessings of this world, uh, the blessings this world will have if wealthy men are saved. Right? Or, okay, let's put it this way. If Christians are wealthy, <laughs> you know, wealthy men, I say that is very difficult, as the Bible says. But if Christians are wealthy, you know, giving alms, all what Cornelius was doing, helping people. And the Bible says in Proverbs 11.10, when it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoices. But when, sorry, and when the wicked perish, there is shouted. So, there are two times that the city is rejoicing. When it's going well with the righteous, so when the Christians, when believers get wealthy, it's going well, they're prospering. And another time the city is rejoicing, that is everybody, their friends, family, relatives. And the city is rejoicing is when the wicked perish. So, you say, oh, Sodom I died. Oh, we should be rejoicing. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, Sodom I died. Oh. Let's just yeah, let's put them in prayers. For what? They are worthy of death. Anyway, let me not digress. Verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself also am a man. Peter deserves more worship than the Pope. Let me repeat myself. Peter deserves more worship than the Pope. But Peter refuses worship. Is that not a lesson for the Pope? Now, the Pope says, or the Catholic says that they are popes, uh, uh, Peter is the first Pope. If Peter is the first Pope, Peter has a family. He's married. He had a mother-in-law that Jesus healed. <laughs> so, he, he's married. Peter did not receive worship. He refused worship. Peter was challenged. Peter was rebuked. I mean, that's who Peter was. But the Pope cannot be touched. No, I mean, they worship him. They kiss at his feet. You know, even Peter was not the vicar of Christ here on earth. <laughs> Peter said, hey, the words of Paul also are... Gospel, uh, a scripture, right? The words of Paul are scripture. It's not, oh, 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 hold up. I'm the vicar of Christ here on earth. Nobody else. I'm the one that carries the words of God. In fact, stop reading your Bible. Stop listening to me. No, Peter said, hey, I have a more sure word of prophecy. I know I saw these things, uh, like I saw the transfiguration, but don't even listen to what I'm saying. I have a more, you have, sorry, you have a more sure word of prophecy, which is the scriptures. You see that? So, Peter is not a pope. Bible says, call no man father, call no man rabbi, call no man master. And this clearly, Peter refusing worship, you know, just destroys that. 
All right, verse 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful, how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. He has learnt the lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Holy Spirit said, go with this guy. And he's finding out well, this guy is, is a Gentile. Obviously, that's what God was trying to teach me. And I was saying, I'm not going to kill Anit. So, now I'm going to have to fellowship with you. I'm going to commune with you. Because the Holy Spirit bade me go. Right? So, verse 29. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying. Gainsaying means without rebuttal, without opposition. Without gainsaying. As soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore, for what intent have ye sent for me? Peter is still in blind obedience. He doesn't know what is going on. So why am I here? I mean, he's not even thinking, oh, maybe they need to get saved, or maybe they need to, be, because he's, that's not even in his mind. So he still has that resentment. Oh, oh, these are not still people of God that deserve the word of God or anything. Like, why am I here? I know G G Holy Spirit told me to come here, but let me just tell you now, this is not tradition. This is wrong. This is unlawful. We're going against the law. <laughs> right? It's unlawful. So what am I doing here? Explain to me. Because I'm only here because the Holy Spirit told me to go. And I didn't oppose him. So explain yourself because your time is running now. Anyway, so Peter clearly learned it and it also showed his mindset. And Jesus has taught him this already. Jesus uh, dealt with Samaritans and he gave many uh, the, uh, the story of the good Samaritan. Remember the woman at the well? Jesus dwelt with them, the Samaritans. So Peter should have learned this. It's not that Jesus didn't teach him this already. Verse 30. And I'm, when, I'm, when I'm saying all these things, these are men. I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't do better. I don't know, I, I'll probably be so much more worse than Peter. It's not me looking down at him and saying, oh, you should know better, you should know better. I'm just trying to show you that these are, number one, are men. They are learning and their experience is what is teaching us. If they write down my own life's experience, you guys will be like, whoa, <laughs> Pastor, you should have known better. You should have done this. You, should, you know, it's very easy to point fingers when it's somebody else's life you're reading. But I'm just trying to point out all these things so that we can learn from it. I'm not looking down at Abraham. I'm not looking down at Peter. I'm not looking at all these guys because they probably great way do way better than I'll do. So don't misunderstand my tone or when I'm saying, oh, he should know better. I'm just trying to point these things out to us so that you don't say, oh, Jesus was at fault. He didn't prepare his disciples. No, he did. But they are human beings. All right, verse 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, sorry, until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So a man, so the angel appeared as a man. So he's just trying to picture this for us. And I've talked about angels before, probably here, that don't don't refuse to help people because that could be an angel and that can be a normal person. Yeah, that was with Philip. I remember that. So it's a man that appeared and he took him in and, you know, listened to him. So we should always uh, be ready to uh, show hospitality to strangers. Anyway, verse 31. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard and thine arms are, in ha are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose son name is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, so you see, is immediately, right? So to show you how much you, how he responded to it. Immediately, therefore, I sent to sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. So. I'm sure Peter's like, wait, what? Like, I, you don't even know what it is? <laughs> like, I'm supposed to figure it out? And the Holy Spirit hasn't told him anything. But God has told him this. It was clear to Peter what he was sent to preach. Open to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter 3, 15. Peter did not consider the good works of Cornelius as a reason for him, Cornelius, to be saved. Peter did not say, hmm, but this guy, you know, he does good. He was even fasting. I mean, the guy said he was fasting, right? Then an angel of God appeared to him. And, you know, he probably have researched about Cornelius, asked about Cornelius. Oh, he's such a great guy. He's, he's you know, the, the servants already told him he's a just man. Right? I mean, the people that came to call Peter said, this guy is saved. He's just. <laughs> right? He's a good guy. But when Peter heard this, he, he, he didn't even think twice. 
about, oh, is this guy saved or is he not saved? He just knew that all those works doesn't count for salvation. See, works don't count for Peter, Peter already knew the message Jesus sent him to preach. Being an apostle. There's a reason why he sent out an apostle to witness these things. And that's exactly what Peter, P Peter is going to do. So, we should always be ready to present the gospel. Man, just say, you know what? I've been praying. I've been, a friend might talk to you, a colleague. I've been praying. I don't know. I'm just so confused. This world. You know, see Joe Biden is the president, the war is coming to an end. That's not the time for you to go Fox News baptism on him. Be like, you know what, that's true. You know, we need to bring Trump back. Yeah, no, no, that's the time to tell him, give him hope. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> We're saved by hope. Give him hope. Talk about the gospel. That's why you're here. That's why he's talking to you. Don't just be like, I don't know what God wants me to tell him. Of course, you have a ministry. <laughs> God, you should know what God wants you to tell him. And Peter knew exactly that. So, you should always be ready to present the gospel. And you don't need to go home and cram it down your head. I need to be ready to present the gospel and all of that. The best way to be always ready is to leave it. Let, let that be your lifestyle. What do I mean? So win it. If you go so winning, you always be ready to present the gospel. You 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 face many kinds of scenarios. You know when to apply, what to apply. So make that your lifestyle, as the apostles made that their lifestyle. And Peter was ready to present the gospel every time, any time. In First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen, the Bible says, "But sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts." And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So be ready always. Verse 34, back to our Bible reading, uh, back to Acts 10. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and walketh righteousness is accepted with him. So at this point, it's according to Peter. After all this time, after Jesus told him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the other parts of the earth, it's just occurring to him that, you know what, maybe we should be spreading the gospel to everybody. I mean, God wants me to spread the gospel to Gentiles. It just occurred to him. <laughs> yeah, it kind of blows my mind sometimes, but yeah, I'm saying this because of hindsight, it's 2020. So his eyes was open, the word of God is coming alive to him, breaking barriers. So. When the word of God comes alive, many times, like when I mean word of God come alive to to me, like when it comes alive to me, it's like it's breaking a barrier. It's like whoa, so God can actually do this. So it's breaking barriers for Peter. This is not it's unlawful for him to commune or come into the house of a stranger like this. Understand, we are all of one race. And what race is that? The human race. Okay? So the Bible does not break all of the same blood. The Bible doesn't break up us into races, uh, whether it's by blood or family or economic status or anything. So we have one blood, whether it's Adam or you want to say Noah, that's fine by me too. So nobody is born superior. Because that's what Peter was thinking. You know, the Jews are superior, they are chosen. Why would you come back, Jesus? Is it now that you're going to give us a kingdom and you reign? Jesus said, It's not. <laughs> they were still missing it. This is all the way back in Acts chapter 1. They're still missing it, and he still had that kind of man mindset. You see that? So, nobody's born superior. The Jews only had an advantage. And what was that advantage? That they had the oracles of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou did not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Open to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. So, nothing makes us differ from another. Whether it's what we receive, or whether it's what we have, anything you have, whether it's oracles of God, you received it. So, don't glory and think you're in, uh, superior because you have something that somebody else did not have. You received it. So, God gave it to you. Now, God is giving it to the Gentiles. Are you going to have an evil eye because of my goodness? That's what Jesus will ask. So, Peter's eye is open and he's like, wow, God is not a respecter of persons. So Cornelius is a perfect example that there are nations that fear God, even if they are not saved. <laughs> Peter said, in anywhere, anybody that fears God, 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 you know, he's not a respecter of persons. There are people, uh, God's not a respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and walketh righteousness is accepted with him. So God will accept that person to be saved. Right? He died for all. So uh, uh, Nineveh is, is another example. They feared God. As soon as the, uh, Jonah came preaching 
the word of God, giving them the message, the fear of God came upon them. And all the animals too were fasting. <laughs> I mean, that's how seriously they feared God. So whether they were saved or not, if they weren't saved, then they got saved. So these are people that feared God. Without the fear of God, people cannot be saved. That's something you have to understand. Because if they are not afraid that God can destroy both body and soul in hell, then what's the use? That's why we make sure we talk about hell. We make sure we talk about the wages of sin, the punishment of sin. So if you don't talk about that, then what are they being saved from? For by grace are you saved through faith. Saved from what? <laughs> right? They like their lifestyle. I'm in a nice house. I'm fine. I don't need saving. But you have to fear God and understand the punishment of God. And that's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ash is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the conclusion. All this is, oh, there's, um, there's none that's righteous, no, not one. They are all gone out of the way. They are there, they are this, they are that, they are that. The point is that they don't fear God. That's the point. Because once they fear God, they'll be like Cornelius. One that fear like God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Cornelius is wise. <laughs> the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Because if you don't fear God, you be like them. Cursing, bitterness, misery ways, no peace. Cornelius had all these things. Although he wasn't saved. So, God, you know, was, he was accepted of God. Verse 36, let's move on. The word which God sent, Paul is, I say Paul, Peter is still talking. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. See, he's putting that there, by Jesus Christ. He's not just Lord of the Jews, right? He's Lord of all. That's, that's what that parenthesis there means, because Peter is understanding. Hey, he's Lord of everybody. He's not just the Lord of the Jews. Keep going, verse 37. That word, I say, ye know. Cornelius knew about Jesus. Right? I mean, for him to know all the laws, know the oracles of God, he probably knows what's happening in Israel. Uh, obviously, in, in Jerusalem, how Jesus was killed. He's a Roman soldier for crying out loud. <laughs> it was the Romans that put him to death. You think he wasn't maybe holding the streets, guards, and all of that. He probably was involved or, or knew the story. It's just like on the road to a mouse, those men that were talking to Jesus, they said, were you living under the rock? Don't you know what's going on? That there's this guy, Jesus, after doing all these things, he, they killed him and that's all we heard of him. So everyone knew about it. People traveling from, you know, the news went around. And Jesus did many great things. So Cornelius knew. So let's keep going. The word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with, with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses. That's how he knew what he was to say to um, Cornelius. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and shewed him openly. So, if you stop there, you're like, you see, he was shown openly. Pause. Next verse. Not to all the people. <laughs> see, Jesus appeared after he rose up, but he didn't just appear to everybody. He appeared to the apostles, right? The ones that he's going to send. And look at the definition there. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us. Who are those witnesses? Us. We, the apostles. Who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead? And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So this is what Peter was, was sent to preach. And he knew the message he had. And clearly this message is not just for the Jews. Or Jews scattered all around. This is messages for the world. For the Gentiles included. And so he gave the message. So that is the gospel being preached. And um, Peter and Apostle knew that message. And Cornelius knew about Jesus. So it was pretty straightforward. 
So the Bible goes on to say in verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Pause. So them which heard the word, the hearing of the word, is talking about them that understood the word. Because it's not just hearing it, that gets you saved is understanding it. I can prove that to you. The parable of the sower. The one that fell on the wayside are those that heard the word, hold up, but did not understand it. So the, uh, the devil came and took it from their hearts. So it's not just hearing it. Hearing means understanding it. That's what hearing means. So I, I can tell I can present this to you that I bet, maybe I should not say bet, but I don't think every single person there was saved. His whole family, his relatives, his friends. You want to tell me, I saw that all of them goes, maybe, and that would be good news. I love that. But it is those that understood that God saved. Because the Bible does not just say, and all of them got saved. <laughs> right? He says, them that heard the word got saved. Verse 45. And they, so the Holy Ghost fell upon them, that heard the word, uh, verse 45, and they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because, uh, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what happened here, the Gentiles started speaking with tongues, right? And they were speaking different languages too. And people of the circumcision, people of circumcision doesn't necessarily mean only Hebrews. Uh, uh, people of circumcision uh, could be people in Joppa that from another tribe, Mesopotamia, different places, just like in Acts chapter 2. And they became Jews because they got circumcised. So they became as Jews. So they, these guys are speaking different languages. Because you could argue, oh, they're speaking Hebrew. How do you know they're speaking with tongues? They've been living with the Hebrews. They know Hebrew methods. So because they're speaking Hebrew, it means they're speaking in tongues. Not necessarily speaking Hebrew. Remember, Peter came from Joppa with believers, with brethren there. And those were people of the circumcision. So they were probably speaking different languages just as they were. Because Peter said that just as we're speaking different languages in Acts chapter 2, that's how these guys were, uh, were doing it. So don't just think, oh, they were speaking Hebrew because they're all Hebrews there. No, they are the circumcision is not just the Hebrews. Okay? I'm just trying to expand your understanding with this. And the Bible says speaking with tongues is a sign for unbelievers. And that transcends just unbelievers as part people that don't believe the gospel. But people that don't believe, period. Right? Because the, the people of the circumcision do not believe that the Holy Ghost can come upon or the, the people of the Gentiles can be saved. They didn't believe that. They didn't believe they need to be saved and be baptized. They didn't believe it. So I'm sure as Peter was preaching, all of them were like, hmm, so what's going to happen? You know, what, what's Peter doing? He's wasting his time. These guys are reprobates. Reprobates! All reprobates! You know. <laughs> no! They could be saved. As Peter was like, they might not have been saying that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just playing out a, a hyperbole, hyperbolic uh, experiment. So, but the fact is that when they started speaking with tongues, they were like, oh, wow. Of oh, the truth, the Holy Ghost has come upon them. So it was shocking to them, and they, uh, they were made believers. So, uh, where was I? Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So what follows after? As soon as, I mean, as Peter was talking, they get the Holy Ghost, they, they start speaking with tongues, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. So what follows after? The Great Commission. You have preaching of the gospel, baptism, discipleship, discipleship rinse and repeat, gospel, baptism, discipleship, that's just the Great Commission. Just keep doing that over and over and over again. That's what the church is supposed to do. So, don't stop now. They've gotten the gospel. What's the next step? Get baptized. So, Peter was talking to the men that accompanied him. What is stopping us? You're right? I mean, I've witnessed to these guys. You yourselves are witnesses that these guys have received the Holy Ghost. That means they are definitely saved. And him talking to the witness, him making sure that he brought witness, that is going to save him in the next chapter. <laughs> we'll get to it next week, but God willing. That's going to save him in the next chapter because they are going to try to uh, you know, interrogate him. 
So be wise. Peter was wise when he was going to the Gentile's house. He went with witnesses. Amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 3, A prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Peter saw possible danger, possible problem. But the Holy Spirit told him to go. Oh, I, I can just go. I don't have to take anybody. I, I, don't need anybody. I, I don't need anybody's proof. I don't need anybody checking me. You know, I just do what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. You know, I, I rule this house, so I don't need anybody checking the books. I don't need anybody checking anything. See, if any higher house I spend the money, that's how I spend the money. No, no, see, no, nobody checks me out. You know, that's how people might think. But Peter said, you know, I'm going to go with some people. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go with witnesses. I'm going to go with backup. Even though I know the Holy Spirit made me go. You see that? So don't just understand. Like you have to deal with understanding. You have to. You're living in this world, folks. <laughs> right? Uh, you have to do things right. By the people also. And that is one of the qualifications of a bishop. Verse 48. And he commanded them to, to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So when he says when they got baptized, what does that mean? It means they joined the church. Right? They, they can now be members of the church. They can now be fellow because they've they, they have an open uh, symbolism of what their inward belief. What has happened inside? The new man, and they've open, they made it, they've symbolized it openly, so they can join the church. So that's what that's another significance of baptism, because number two, it means that you're ready to start obeying God. The first commandment: get baptized. That is the first, and it's so easy. <laughs> it's it's not hard. It's not rocket science. You don't have to pay money. It's just dip yourself inside water and come back out. Like, I mean, get your clothes wet, but you dry it. I mean, come on. So get baptized so once that is a sign that okay i'm starting to obey god because you can get saved don't get baptized you still go to heaven but you're not ready to live right because once you're ready to live right you only live right through the church not outside the church paul did not have his own polar white ministries right paul went through the church it's the church that sent paul so that's the only way to live right and be pleasing in the eyes of god and baptism and somebody has to baptize you <laughs> I don't care who you are, how, where you were born, anything. Somebody has to baptize you. It shows you're going through the church. Anyway, so it says they got baptized in the name of the Lord. It's not that they said they were baptized saying in the name of Jesus. You know, for you, for the oneness is people that believe, oh, everything is in the name of Jesus. Jesus is, you know, God manifests himself in three modes and stuff. No, in the name of the Lord means in the authority of God, in the authority that Jesus gave them. So, what did Jesus tell them to do? Baptize in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. That's how they got baptized, because they baptized in the authority that Jesus gave them. So, let's find out what Jesus told them to do. So, that's how they got baptized. People don't understand English, and they just say, oh, you see, they're baptizing just in the name of the Lord, or just in the name of Jesus. So, um, yeah, being saved transcends races, status, age, and other barriers. Understand, uh, Peter had to overcome this, and the Holy Spirit went through all this just to teach him, you know, and uh, understand that we are brethren. We are one church, one body, we are family. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Very interesting story here, Acts chapter 10. I pray, O Lord, that you help us to understand that we are all one family. Uh, these things that Peter had to learn, uh, we learn it here. Uh, we're seeing it here. We're experiencing it here. Uh, I pray, O oh Lord, I continue to bless us as a church and uh, use us as a church, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray as we go home, take us home safely. Bring us back next time in the name of, in, to the glory of your name, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.